My name is Chad, and I have the privilege of serving as uh, one of the pastors here at First Baptist Church. We are celebrating Easter today. Now, in Christian circles, we sometimes talk about the week leading up to Easter as Holy Week. And there's certain things that happen on those days. There's lots of discussion. Of, as you compare all the accounts of Jesus' life in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, what happened on those days. We know the Sunday before Easter is the triumphant entry. Uh, Palm Sunday, we sometimes call it. Jesus comes into Jerusalem to great fanfare and the cheers of the crowds. On Monday, he uh, came to the temple and he found that they were doing everything in that temple except worshiping God. And he, he turned over tables of money changers. He drove out the people just buying and selling. They turned it into a flea market in there in the temple. And he said, this is not what this place is for. It's a day of teaching. On Tuesday, we find Jesus teaching in the temple, teaching his disciples, teaching crowds. And, and all these people who, they, they want to shut Jesus down. They want to rub him out. Uh, they're attacking him all day. He's like a punching bag on Tuesday. On Wednesday of that Holy Week, Jesus spends most of, the, most of the day with dear friends, people he loves and they love him in Bethany. And uh, I believe it's probably a day of a lot of prayer and a lot of spiritual preparation for all that's to come. Thursday is a day of a lot of teaching. He teaches his closest disciples. He prepares them for what's to come. We have the Last Supper taking place on Thursday. Friday, we have all the stories of Jesus arrested in the garden early, early on, uh, on that Friday. And then to be tried and beaten and whipped and nailed to the cross. And Jesus hung on a cross for six hours that Friday and he died the sinless son of God for the sins of the world we know on Easter Jesus was raised from the dead and often what happens is that we skip past Saturday and the thing about Saturday is it's a day of silence there are not things happening on on Saturday, I want to read the Saturday part of the story, Friday leading into Saturday, from Luke's Gospel, chapter 23, verse 50, and it says, there was a good and righteous man named Joseph, a member of the Sanhedrin, who had not agreed with their plan and action. He was from Arimathea, a Judean town. He was looking forward to the kingdom of God. He approached Pilate and asked for Jesus' body. Taking it down, he wrapped it in fine linen and placed it in a tomb cut into the rock where no one had ever been placed. It was the preparation day and the Sabbath was about to begin. The women who had come with him from Galilee followed along and observed the tomb and how his body was placed. Then they returned and prepared spices and perfumes and they rested on the Sabbath according to the commandment. So, there's some important things about Saturday. Saturday is Jesus, and a stone is rolled over the entrance to the tomb, and Saturday is a silent day. But there's some important things about Jesus being placed in that tomb and Saturday. Now, one of those things is going to be this. The gospel writers thought it was important to note the Jesus who died on a cross on Friday, placed in the tomb. On Saturday, he was still in the tomb. The women, they knew he was dead. They did great preparation, getting ready to honor his body properly. And they were rushed and weren't able to do it immediately, but planned to come back after the Sabbath was over because Jesus had died. The second thing is that the tomb does establish the final act of Jesus' death. And there have been skeptics for a long time who said, well, Jesus didn't actually die on the cross. Uh, he, uh, he just passed out, and then his followers, his disciples saw him later. and They, they, uh, they marked it up to, well, uh, 
Look, he's alive. He's raised from the dead because he didn't really die. But the tomb of Saturday says he was very much dead. And all their preparations pointed that way. We talked last Sunday about a Roman centurion who carried out Jesus' execution, an expert in death who made doubly sure Jesus was dead, piercing his side with a spear. The historic fact of Jesus' death is certainly uh, a part of the story of the tomb. And on a, on a more just straight up spiritual level, the burial of Christ was important because his burial took this atonement one step further. We, we think about Jesus atoning for our sin, paying for our sin, separated from God by our sin. Jesus paid a price so that we could be brought together with God. Relationship restored, established, and eternity secured. What Jesus did here, he died on the cross and he buried our sins at the tomb. Okay. So Saturday, between Friday and the story of the cross and Sunday and the story of the resurrection. And in my thinking about this story, reading through again uh, the story in each of the four Gospels, Saturday really spoke to me this year. Because you look at those other days we talked about from Palm Sunday and the celebration, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, right on to all those other days, there was stuff going on. There were actions and there was teaching and there were things happening and Events and people, but not on Saturday. That God seems silent on Saturday. There's something about that that really resonates with me. I've been walking with the Lord for a long time now. And sometimes I feel His presence. Some of you might say you've never felt His presence. Um, but I, I've, I feel God's presence. It's so immediate. It's so close. It's so real. It's so powerful. And, and sometimes he is so quiet, so silent. And that silence causes a lot of pain and confusion uh, because it's not what God says to us that causes it. It's the fact that in difficulty with hurt and pain and loss and struggle, He just seems to say nothing at all. And you, you want to kind of call out those seasons. God, where are you? Can you hear me? Do, do you still care about me? I think uh, all of us, probably different levels, we know what hopelessness feels like, feels like. Um, not maybe the level of despair, but maybe. But hopelessness when you, you're going through what you're going through and you look forward and you just don't see how tomorrow or next year even or the days ahead are going to get any better. And you just feel trapped, stuck. No possibility of improvement or change. It seems possible. And uh, one guy I was reading, he said, Many people today are drowning in a sea of hopelessness surrounded by a land of emptiness, and there just seems no way out. God feels silent to you. It's maybe not in every area of your life, but maybe in some area of your life where you've been calling out to him. Begging, pleading. That's the way it was for that guy Job in the Old Testament. Job suffered so much and his story uh, so real for so many of us, so personal. He wanted to hear from God and he didn't understand why he was suffering. He just calls out to God, pleads, let the Almighty answer me. Just tell me something, but don't leave me in silence. You know, there are days, sometimes seasons, and sometimes whole generations in the Bible that the people of God, now the people of God, I'm not talking about the pagan world, the people of God struggle 
with silence. And that time comes in a time of crisis and pain and loss and grief and confusion. And they call out and they call out and they call out. And, and it seems, you may have prayed like this, and it feels like the prayers are just bouncing off the ceiling. There have been a couple of seasons in my life that uh, would describe, uh, it's an ancient phrase, uh, the dark night of the soul when... Uh, I was doing all the things to stay connected, to keep close to God, all the things I'd done before, and, and God just felt far away. And His timing was way too slow for my taste, and His plans uh, way too vague for my patience. And now what I found coming out of those times that God taught me some things during those seasons that I never would have learned if He hadn't pushed me hard. And I started to pray differently in those seasons. When things are hard like that, I read my Bible in a different way. And, you know, God's never silent because His Word is His voice. He speaks to us through His Word. It's always, always available. Sometimes it just doesn't feel, uh, doesn't feel close and it doesn't feel warm. I know that Biblical community has been raised in my priorities in those times when God feels so silent. I needed the encouragement. I think about, I think about Peter and John and Mary and all these, all these followers that they said, we're putting all our trust in this guy, Jesus. We believe he's the hope of the world. He's our hope. We, we, we're going to entrust our lives to him. We, we believe he's the promised one of God. Uh, he's our only hope in, in this broken, far from God world. And on Saturday, so, so silent. And that's how it felt. And sometimes it feels that way for us. And I just want you to remember this. God's silence is how it feels. It's not how it is. In my Bible reading this year, I like to, some people like to keep the same Bible for a lot of years, and I like to buy a new Bible every year. And I take that new Bible, and I highlight, I circle things, and I underline things, and I star things, and this, this Bible's getting all marked up. I'm about two-thirds of the way through reading through the, this brand new Bible that I bought for Christmas this year. And each time I read through like that, I mark different I find I mark different things that I've marked different before. And this time, one of the things I've marked consistently is every time I run into some phrase, and it's often this way, how long? And I'm amazed at how many times in the Bible godly, wonderful people inspired by the Holy Spirit to record these words are crying out to God and saying, how long? How long is it going to feel like this? How long until this weight is lifted? How long until the skies that are so stormy around me, how long until they clear? The psalmist in Psalm 13, he, he, he says it this way, how long, Lord? Will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? Some of you feel a little of that, how long? Silence in response from God. I want to remind you, the silence of Saturday was shattered by the risen Christ. We're going to start today with Saturday. What's the question you have for God today? What do you need from God? What's the area where he feels, it feels his voice is silent, that you just need him to speak? Where do you need a breakthrough? Let's spend just a few moments, the silence of these moments, preparing our hearts for this time together. As we shift from Saturday to Sunday, let's listen for God and ask him, God, this is where I need you. 
I need you to reveal yourself to me. I need you to show me you're real. I need you to speak. If you're a God who speaks, I need you to speak to me. And let's see what God might do in our hearts on a Sunday. That's the third time I got to hear them do that. And if we give them about four more tries, they're going to have that thing down. That's, that was good. I've enjoyed, I appreciate them so much giving their day to uh, sharing the good news. This is a day to celebrate Jesus raised from the dead. A lot of people have heard this story. They say, oh yeah, Jesus raised from the dead, the resurrection. I just don't understand it. or I don't know what it's about or why it's a, so, so important. Amazingly, the Gallup organization, they, they did this national survey here in these United States. People who never attend church. 84% of them said, yeah, I believe Jesus raised from the dead. Jesus came back from the dead. So I'm, uh, I'm good with that. I, I, but I'm, I'm not sure how it relates to my life. And that's a, believing it's a great, it, it, that's just a good plan because it's historically verified. So the whole city of Jerusalem was talking about it. Jesus didn't do this in secret. He did it quite publicly he appeared to multiple people multiple groups there are at least 15 references in the historical background of Matthew Mark Luke and John that tell this story uh, and then in the on beyond in Paul's letters we find he appeared uh, he appeared sometimes to uh, one individual sometimes to a group one time one time he appears at the Sea of Galilee and his disciples, they come in with their boat, and he cooks breakfast for them and eats breakfast with them. And Jesus wasn't uh, Jesus the friendly ghost, some kind of apparition, but Jesus is a bodily resurrection. Tells us what uh, it'll be like in the resurrection for those who have placed their faith in Christ. Uh, that he was touchable, he approachable, personal. The Bible tells us, passage I read earlier from 1 Corinthians, 500 people at one time gave witness to the risen Christ, saw him, heard him, talked to him. So a lot of people uh, were a part of this, this experience. Here's the story from Luke chapter 24. We finished up in chapter 23 earlier, Jesus buried. Now, this is the Easter story from Luke 24. We, we kind of reviewed it with the children earlier. On the first day of the week, very early in the morning, they came to the tomb, talking about that group of women who had seen where Jesus had been placed in the tomb. Came to the tomb, bringing the spices they had prepared. They found the stone rolled away from the tomb. They went in, but did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. Now, while they were perplexed about this, suddenly two men stood by them in dazzling clothes. So the women were terrified and bowed down to the ground. Why are you looking for the living among the dead, asked the men. He's not here, but he has risen. Remember how he spoke to you when he was still in Galilee, saying, it is necessary that the Son of Man be betrayed into the hands of sinful men, be crucified, and rise on the third day. And then they remembered his words. Jesus did rise, and he is who he said he was, and he has the power he said he had, and he keeps his promises. So here's the question. So why does the resurrection matter? Why does the risen Christ matter? What difference does it make? It's the difference maker for those of us who are caught in a moment or in a season of silence. It's a word of hope that shatters the darkest shroud of silence. He is risen. Here are some good reasons why we celebrate Easter as followers of Jesus Christ why we encourage others, why we tell this story to others, because it means my past can be forgiven. My past can be forgiven. And that's just good news. I'm not a, I'm not a real home improvement kind of guy. You wouldn't want to hire me for that. You wouldn't want me to help you with that. But I've started into some projects, and I get into the project, and I'm going to take care of it. I just need a more open tomb. That's just me. <laughs> I got into projects. I got halfway through and I thought, wow, this is terrible. I, 
I wish I hadn't have done this. I'm going to have to pay more money to get this fixed now that I started it. And I wish I, wish I just paid somebody to begin with instead of getting myself into that mess. You wish you could just start over sometimes. A lot of people feel that way about life. We just wish... We just wish there are things that we've done that we wish we had not done. Things we said that we wish we had not said. Things we've thought that we wish we hadn't even thought. And you just wish you could just start from scratch. You could say, okay, that aside and I am starting all over again. We feel bad about the things we've done. We have this guilt. We carry this weight. We have these regrets. I came across this in a book written by a pastor and he said he received this letter, and the person gave, his, gave him permission to put it in his book anonymously. This was her letter she sent to the pastor. I'm 31 years old and divorced, though I fought the divorce bitterly. I feel bad. I have no hope for my future. Often I go home and I cry, but there's no one holding me when I cry. Nobody cares. Nothing changes, and I continue to fail. I'm stressed out emotionally. I feel I'm on the verge of a collapse Something is very wrong. But, but I feel so hurt and embittered that I can scarcely react or relate to others anymore. I feel as if I'm going to have to sit out the rest of my life in the penalty box. The tragedy is I know a lot of people that feel that way. And you, you get stuck. You ever been stuck? You feel like I can't go on with the present and I can't even imagine the future because I'm so stuck in the past by the guilt and the shame and the failures and the regrets and just has me tied down. Sometimes we let things of the past so mess up things that we can't go forward and have great relationships and take big next steps and find joy and purpose in the future. This is the good news of Easter and a risen Savior. The Bible says, He canceled the record of the charges against us and took it away by nailing it to the cross. That is just a great verse in the Bible. What Jesus did, he said, all that past, all that shame, all that guilt, all those failures, Jesus died on the cross, nailed those things to the cross, and you can leave them there. I don't have to pay for my sin because Jesus has paid. He was hung on that cross so I could get free of all my hang-ups in life. Jesus was nailed to the cross so I can quit nailing myself to the cross. Today's a day when you can experience some real freedom in Christ. He wants to forgive your past. He wants to cancel every debt that you owe. Emotional debts, relational debts, the sin debt you owe to God. He wants to wipe it clean. That's what the resurrection says. Jesus has paid it all. Second thing about this re resurrection it means my present problems can be managed. So I live here in North Texas, and I've lived here for over a couple of decades now. And I hear this all the time from you know, in a lot of different levels, a lot of different people. We're just really busy, busy people. And the complaint I hear often is, sometimes it just feels like my life is out of control. You ever feel that way? Like it's just going to run right out from under you? I feel powerless Powerless to change my situation, powerless to break a bad habit, powerless to fix a broken relationship, powerless to get out of debt, powerless to manage my over-busy schedule. Well, here's the thing. What you need is you need a power that's greater than you. And the good news, uh, this would be liberating for, for you maybe today, God never intended for you to have to manage all that and do all that and carry all that. He has a better plan than that. He wants to have a relationship with you. And this is the great news of Easter. These are two of my favorite verses in the Bible. And I, I want you to listen carefully. Read the, I also pray. Paul's praying for people in Ephesus. They needed a good praying for. So do I. I also pray that you will understand the incredible greatness of God's power. So you feel powerless? God has great power. For those of us who believe in Him. This is the same mighty power that raised Christ from the dead. Now, don't miss the truth of that story. He says, you feel powerless, you feel overwhelmed, outgunned, outmanned. Here's the good news of the gospel. The good news that Jesus died on the cross to pay for our sin, that he sealed the victory of the cross, demonstrated the power of the cross. Here, Paul says, 
the same power that accomplished this work is available to you as somebody who knows Jesus. It's available to you that you can be set free. The same power that raised Jesus from the dead can help you rise above your problems. The same power used in Jesus being raised 2,000 years ago can be used in your life right now. Now, I don't know what the future holds. I I don't know what's going to happen tomorrow or next week or next year. But that doesn't matter. Because even though all those things are out of my control, they're not out of God's control. They're not out from under or beyond the power of Christ Jesus raised from the dead. In the book of Philippians, Paul, he gives such great hope and power to to Jesus and all he has done. He says, I can do everything through Christ who gives me strength. I can do everything through Christ, through Christ who gives me strength. And he says, I want to help you out. I recognize uh, life's hard. I know a lot of stories about a lot of people. And some of you just came crawling in here today. It's, it's rough. And, you know, on the outside, all looks well. But well, your heart is worn out today. And you'd say, it's been a tough week. And some of you would say, it's been a tough, long time. And God wants to say this to you. Don't you give up. No problem is too big for God. No situation is hopeless if you'll turn it over to Him. And He does not say, Paul does not say, I can do all things because I'm awesome. He doesn't say, I can do all things because I'm going to pick myself up by my own bootstraps. I can do all things because I'm a really religious guy. He says, I can do all things. I can accomplish everything whatever the challenge, whatever the difficulty, whatever the broken place in me, through Christ who gives me strength. I'm ready for anything because of Jesus in me. I have all kinds of weaknesses, faults, and failures. But Christ in me, I charge hell with a water pistol. I'm not afraid because of Christ. And the third thing, what the empty tomb says is, my future can be secure. One of the universal problems in the world, and we come in here and you you can say, what what are the biggest problems in your life? And you'll say, well, let's see, it's this and this and this. You know, we're wrestling with debt. I'm trying to raise my kids. Uh, You have your list. But here's one that's going to relate to everybody in the room. I'm I'm saying this to you because I want to encourage you and pick you up on Easter. You're all going to die. Yeah, you're all terminal. Just so you know. Death rate in the United States, you know what it is now? 100%. Yeah, we're all terminal. I told you, aren't you glad you came to Easter now? Yeah. And here's what happens. Uh, this is something, it's going to happen. I mean, that, that's, that's a picture of what happens in the world. And if you know something's going to happen, wouldn't it seem foolish to not prepare for something you know is going to happen? But what we say is, well, yeah, I know, but I'm really busy right now. I got a lot going on right now in my life. See, we're trying to take care of that work is just crazy. I, my stuff with my kids because their age, or taking care of my aging parents. I mean, I got, I got, I'm juggling all these balls and trying to trying to keep myself afloat. um, So I'll get around to that. One of these days. One of these days. But, but when does that day come? We, 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 we avoid the topic because we don't like to talk about death. And you don't, if you don't believe me, why don't you call up some of your best friends to get home from church? Call up some of your best friends and say, Hey, you guys you want to come over this evening? Got some pie and some cake and we'll have some coffee and we'll sit around. It's going to be a beautiful springtime day. We'll talk about death for a couple of hours. Just see who shows. We do not like talking about this. U.S. News and World Report ran a cover article and it said that more people believe in heaven and hell now in this country than ever before in history. Now. We think, oh, well, that, that, that's something people don't believe anymore. Well, you know, come to find out, they really believe it a lot. It is on people's minds because people want to know what happens. We know we're terminal. So what happens after that? 
A lot of people, oh, I'm not afraid to die. Now I'm terribly afraid about what comes after that. Absolutely. There are a lot of misconceptions about what's going to happen. A lot of, a lot of weird ideas about heaven today. Uh, and we're having, uh, I mean, Ross alluded to it during the baptism time. We're having lots of spiritual conversations. We're, and it's a lot of fun to talk to people about spiritual things. And we've found people are really open to having that conversation. So, what about heaven? Well, I, I think heaven's going to be like this. I think here's how you get there. And everybody has an idea about all that stuff. I'd really encourage you. Why don't you read the primary source and see what the Bible, the Bible tells us what heaven is going to be like and how you get there and all those things. So spend time in the Bible. We encourage people to get into a, a Bible discovery. Talk about what the, what the Word says. If you're not in a, part, in a group like that, just let me know. Call us up. My email is published. The number here at the church. Give us a holler. We'll work it out to... Look at what the Bible says. We love sitting down and having those spiritual conversations. And not to pound you over the head with that Bible, but to let the Bible speak to you. It's amazing what's in God's Word. What's it going to be like? Well, one of the things the Bible's going to tell us is in this broken, weird world we live in, uh, heaven's pretty exciting because it's perfect. It's perfect. Perfect love, perfect peace, perfect joy, perfection. There's no sin, there's no mistakes, there's no evil, nothing bad, no errors. It's perfect in every way. But the second thing that this book's going to tell us is, in order for you to go there, you just need to be perfect. Okay, well, that's a terrible news, right? That is not working out for anybody. You have to be perfect to be in this perfect place. Only perfection can exist in heaven in the presence of God. And I said, well, thanks a lot. That leaves me out. Yeah, me too. If that is it, I'll never be able to be there. And that's the point. We've all messed up. The Bible says all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Like here's God and he's perfect. We're not even close to that. There's none righteous, right in relationship to other people or to God. No, not one, the Bible says. Yeah, that's the case. So, two ways to get to heaven. One way, be perfect. From the day you're born till the day you die. Never make a mistake. Never make a bad call. You just do, never sin. Always do it right your entire life, and everything's going to be grand. And nobody's getting in on that plan. There are all kinds of religions in the world, and they're all performance-based for the most part. Um, and a lot of a lot of expressions of Christianity are performance-based. It's based on, what do I have to do? I'm going to check these religious boxes. I'm going to try really hard. I'm just going to hope that, you know, at the moment I die, I hope I'm 51% of the good on the scales of good and bad. Maybe that'll be good enough. And that's a horribly insecure way to face eternity, just not knowing if you've done it or not, if you're there or not. But see, God loves us too much to leave you with that kind of vague experience when it comes to your eternal soul and so his plan is completely different than all those climb the ladder uh, improvement try really hard be religious plans see God said okay how about this I'll send my perfect son to live a perfect life Jesus God in a body on this earth and he is nailed to the cross as a perfect sacrifice for sin because sin requires a blood sacrifice according to the Bible. There's a high price to be paid. Jesus dies on the cross, placed in the tomb. He's raised from the dead. And when he did that, he proved what he did there, paid everything that needed to be paid for our sin, and he proved he was God. And that's what Easter is about. Jesus said this, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except by me. It's not lots of ways. I mean, that's a unique story. If there were lots of ways, God would say, oh yeah, that's what some people believe, and that's okay. They're just other ways. If there were other ways, God wouldn't have done it like this. There's only one way, and it's through Jesus. And it doesn't make it mathematically 
Two plus two equals four. Truth is always narrow. And then when it comes to spiritual things, people just go all over the place. Like truth can be anything you want it to be. When it comes to forgiveness of sin and eternal life and the presence of God, it cannot be so. I believe when you get to heaven, this is a diagnostic question I've asked people for a long time. Some of you are familiar with it. So when you get to, get to the gates of heaven and God says, okay, why should I let you into my heaven? What are you going to tell him? Some of you have asked people that question before. What are you going to tell him? Most people would say, well, you know, I tried, you know, did my best, tried hard, did some good stuff, gave to the poor uh, sometimes, uh, you know, tried to be a good neighbor, a guy next door. Uh, what's a good answer to that? Uh, last Saturday, Rhonda and I, my dear wife, we went to Costco. You know why? Because we don't have good sense. Why would you go to Costco on Saturday? That's a terrible idea. But, but we went to Costco down here in Plano on Saturday. And we found a parking place, miraculously enough. People everywhere. And, and we started in. Rhonda has the card to get through the door. And Rhonda's a more aggressive walker than I am. I'm, uh, I'm kind of laid back in a crowd, and I'm just easy going and just strolling along. And Rhonda's cutting through, and she's making time. And she pulls out her cart, flashes it through. They wave her on in. And then I'm, I'm, I'm farther and farther back as time goes on. And there's 20 people between us. And when I get to the door, I come walking up. And this, this woman, she's not very old, and she's not very large. She's very intimidating, it's turned out. And she stops me cold, and she says, where's your card? I have a card. And then at this point, Rhonda has realized she's abandoned me. And so she, she turns back, and I, said, and I said, I'm with her. And Rhonda publicly admitted to it. <laughs> and they waved me on through. When I get to heaven, God says, why should I let you into my kingdom? I know me. I'm a sinner saved by grace. And I just say, I'm with Jesus. I'm with Jesus. I'm coming in because I know him. God says, welcome. And that's why this story of the cross and resurrection is so important. Not because of what I've done or who I am or what I've accomplished. Because of Jesus, my relationship to him. Th there comes a point where you have to decide about Jesus. What are you going to do with what are you going to do with Jesus? What are you going to do with this story? And a lot of people say, well, I'm going to keep studying or I'm going to keep thinking about it. Or I'm going to keep trying everything else first or this season of my life is way too busy and I don't have time for that. But one of these days I'll get around to it or I'll do that when I'm, in, when I'm really old because I'm young and I got plenty of time to work. But here's what the Bible says. The right time is now. Today is the day of salvation. Because you know what? I don't know about tomorrow. I don't know about this afternoon. But God's given us today, on this Easter Sunday morning, we've been inviting folks, why not today? Why not say, I've heard this story, I'm familiar with it, this is not unheard of territory, and I know I can't do this myself. I've been trying to do it myself, and I know that's not working out for me. I know I need Jesus. I'd like to start over my past. Forgive. I, I need help today with that relationship and, and just going through the challenges of day-to-day -day life. And I want to know my eternity in heaven is secure and settled once and for all. So here's the, here's the way God reaches out to us in love. He does this for free. He loves you. He cares about you. Grace means not because you earned it, deserved it, or you're doing a lot of religious stuff. Or you'd be trying to be a good person. Because... Grace, it's just free. And he says, I want, you to have, I want to have a relationship with you. 
I want, I want to take away all your sin. I want to free you from that burden. And I want you to know that when this life is over, you're going to be with me forever in heaven. He's reaching out already, but he invites us to reach back in faith. I, I don't understand everything but why God chose to do it that way. I, I don't understand everything about what happened on that cross, but I believe this. I believe what Jesus did there paid everything that needed to be paid. And I believe he proved it was paid here when he was raised from the dead. And I believe he is God in a body on this earth, the son of God because of the empty tomb. And I'm just trusting that. And I, I want to crown Jesus the king of my life. Now, I'm, I've been doing my own plan. I want to follow his plan from here and forevermore. I'm giving my life to Jesus. Has there ever been a time in your life where you began a relationship to Jesus? Uh, man, I've used my wedding ring for a long time. I, I knew Rhonda for three years before we got married. We dated for most of those three years, but... We weren't married until she put this ring on my finger and I put one on her finger. And from that point, we'd be, we, had a, we were married. Not just knowing, well, a lot of people know about Jesus. They've heard this story, but there comes a point where you say, and now, we're in a relationship. Has there been a time in your life? If there's never been such a time, here, it is as simple as this, to just tell God, I'm ready. I want to give my life to Jesus.